Um, I, my name is Brian Zimmerman. I'm with Grand Dial Communications. Uh, we are a full service voice over IP telecom company. Um, and I've been working with the Asterisk platform. Oh, geez. I think since two, 2000, I believe was when we started playing with it when it was in really, really early alpha. And, um, and then we've been really leveraging it. Uh, since approximately 2003, uh, very heavily in the industry. Uh, we became a phone company in 2005, was when we actually started offering voice over IP phone service, uh, designed basically around the asterisk engine. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and just um, uh, have an open conversation. I've got some information on asterisk and then we'll go ahead and uh, move into a, a just an ongoing conversation. So, can you guys hear me? Okay, loud and clear. Yep. Loud okay. and clear. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, and we're going to see if this video works. Um, I don't know if there's an option here. Yeah, I don't know if there's an option here to. See if this works. Let's see if this video works here. Welcome to Asperger's Hall. Yes, you're in exactly the right place. If you're looking for instance. Can you guys hear the audio from that video? Yeah, we can hear it. Thanks. Okay. The most powerful, the most flexible, and the most sophisticated open source communications engine in the world. People are using Asterisk for all sorts of things, from video conferencing applications to web RTC gateways and solutions, all the way through to regular PDX responsibilities. My name is David Decker, and I'm the worldwide community director for the Asterisk Open Source Project. And I'd like to tell you about some of the resources available to you through this website. Resources like the wiki at wiki.ospris.org. All the documentation, all the technical stuff you're going to need is there. Then there's the community. You go to community.ospris.org to find forums, lists, and all of the kind of interactions you're going to need. Then there's training. We've got training in this country and all over the world, details through this website. Then there is the events. There are Aspris events happening in all sorts of places, but I would like to draw your attention to just one, and that is Aspricon. Our global gathering, six to eight hundred people, three days of just Aspris. Yes, if you're serious about Aspris, you're going to want to attend Aspris. Last is the Digion products. Of course, with Digion being the creator, the maintainer, and primary sponsor of the Aspris project, our products are going to give you the Rolls Royce experience for your Aspris implementation. So, why are you going to want to get involved? Well, it's simple. There are three reasons. Number one, you're going to learn a whole lot faster. Number two, you'll be having the ability to network with other like-minded people doing similar things to you with Asterisk. And then lastly, you get the ability to give back, to contribute, and make Asterisk an even better project. So whatever it is you want for your Asterisk implementation, there is something here at Asterisk.org for you. Okay. Um, I wanted to start out with that video because um, they've uh, given a pretty good overview of what Asterisk is, is capable of and available with, for. So um, <clears throat> one couple of things with Asterisk. Asterisk is a telecommunication platform for voice over IP. Um, it, they go far beyond it with today's implementations of Asterisk. He mentioned the WebRTC, a uh, number of systems use it for conferencing as well as other voice platforms. Uh, there's a number of people using it for, <coughs> excuse me, a number of people using them for using the asterisk for uh, calling platforms for robo dialers, which is very unfortunate, um, but that seems to be very popular as well. Um, the asterisk platform is an engine out of the box. Um, you really don't get a, a full featured usable phone platform. Uh, they've got a project called free PBX, which is 
a small business PBX implementation that's built on asterisk that's maintained by the open source community. And that gives you a full featured um, uh, basic PBX platform, a lot of additional auxiliary features and things like that that are constantly being added. Um, however, uh, the engine itself pretty much can be shaped into any communication platform if you're willing to put the time and resource into it. So, um, again, Digium, uh, as he stated, is the founder, uh, the founding company and maintainer of the pro program. I, um, currently, I don't know if you're aware, Digium was actually bought out, though. Um, a company called Sengoma purchased them. So the Digium, uh, albeit is uh, still the owner of the project, um, the source code is open source. It can be uh, forked and taken offline um, to, uh, to be edited as long as it maintains its open source um, licensing. But uh, Sangoma owns the product and they've been slowly absorbing it into their channel. If you call Digium today, they make it well known that they are a, a Sangoma company and they're leveraging the Sangoma resources for that project. So, um, what do you guys know about Asterisk? I, I, I want to focus kind of the next part of the conversation around kind of answering your questions and expanding in areas of interest to you guys. So, what's what's of most interest to you, Paul and Sam? So, uh, one thing I'm kind of interested in that I never got a uh, chance to explore was kind of encrypted calls and Asterisk, and I know that's something that kind of popped up in the last fifteen years or so. Okay, so you're interested in encrypted calls? Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if there's any suppliers that actually uh, provide the ability to have an encrypted call all the way from my PBX to their uh, the connection. I'm sorry, you broke up there on the last end of that. The encrypted call from the PBX to where? Uh, their PSDN uh, interfaces. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I'll speak, I'll speak to that, um, a little bit, uh, the, you can do TLS based encryption on your, on your channels. Uh, it does increase the CPU utilization, but not by a lot. Um, the, the benefit of that is obviously you can encrypt the T, the TCP and the RTB streams and keep them from being able to be replayed without the encryption keys. The. You know, there's pros and cons to this. Um, snagging unencrypted packets and trying to put them together in an audio stream, if you have the ability to man in the middle or set in the chain, there is definitely a potential interest there to be able to encrypt and maintain that. Um, but as, as you alluded to, Paul, realistically, it's where, you know, who are you trying to secure from, you know, your audio conversations from? If you're looking to secure from the government and things like that, the minute you go to a PSTN network, you actually basically are are open to a wiretap at that point anyways. So the really the only effective use of TLS is to keep your your conversations private, um, you like your internal conversations. If you're running your PBX for your business on the open internet and you want to have internal conversations that you, you want to make sure that nobody could man in the middle of those, that's where TLS really comes in and makes a big benefit because you, if you control the asterisk gateway and you then control the endpoints, you can then make end-to-end make -end encrypted communications. Um, if you're doing SIP trunking, Again, you, you know, you could run TLS to your carrier, um, but the minute you leave your your equipment and you go to a non-encrypted leg, the audio is definitely vulnerable. So I, I have a number of customers that can get very concerned about encryption on their calls. And the my answer to them is, is you know, if you're if you're in a high security environment and things like that, encryption may be important to you. But um, you know, most customers we tell them, okay, if you're that worried about security, 
the first thing you need to do is actually replace your Linksys router or your, you know, your your cheap security around you. That's going to get you more security. When you actually then implement the TLS into the environment, then you actually have a a full solution. Yeah, uh, and I'm more worried about um, the actual interface to the PSCN, and I realize once I get on the uh, telephone network, it's a lost cause. But if I'm yeah. going to a conference or something like that, I want to make sure that people aren't capturing my packets when I'm trying to pay like a an internet bill or something like that with my credit card. Okay. So in that particular in that particular environment, um, who's your carrier that you're using for your um, for your your uh, SIP trunking? Uh, I'm using two Vitel or Vitality and Vitality. Uh, yeah. Okay. Do they offer TLS as an option? I think Twilio does. I don't know about Vitel. Yeah. I know Twilio offers TLS. Um, I know their reliability on their TLS has been rather low. Um, but, you know, like I said, I, I don't know how far they go. I know once you actually step off of their network, a lot of the carriers don't support full TLS um, on their switches. They require you to go SS7. And so it depends on how the carriers implement. But if you are looking to go from your your credit card, you know, um, I guess at that point, you know, really implementing the TLS bridge, you would have to look at your carrier to see what, how, you know, how they're implementing it. But usually you, you get your TLS certificate, you uh, implement it. Uh, we traditionally do it through um, Let's Encrypt and we auto renew our certificates. Um, and then Based on that, we implement the certificate into the system, and then we TLS handshake with our different carriers um, or with the client endpoints. So that's that's how we implement with the TLS. Um, I I know most of our carriers do not fully support TLS. Um, we have we have three that do, um, but the bulk of them don't fully support TLS properly, and so those customers that want that end-to-end -end encryption, we actually route a number of them out higher cost PRI connections. Uh, the downside to that is, is the cost of the calls go up. You know, the, the, the call route costs go up and that, but those customers that do want that because we can go TLS and we go directly into our PRI and then we can write SS7 from our, across our PRIs directly into our carrier switches. So that guarantees us P, uh, TLS based routes um, all the way until we hand it off to the carrier. So that's kind of what we've seen inside of the um, inside of the industry. But um, like I said, the TLS support, I think is going to get better over probably the next two to three years we're starting to see the carriers upgrade their switches to support it. And I said, I, I, with Vitality, I don't know if, they, if they've if they supported it today. Are there any other uh, SIP providers that you could recommend that um, would be interested in serving um, kind of like hobbyist uh, type groups? Well, I mean, we, we do TLS, um, we do SIP trunks for some of our customers and we do offer the TLS on that. Um, and like I said, I mean, it comes down to the t full TLS routes. Level three um, had a TLS product, but it's now being absorbed. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, that one's kind of in flux. And level three usually requires you be at a much higher level volume than, yeah. than independent. So um, I would have to double check and see. We have one new vendor that we brought on within the last six months, and they're touting their TLS. We've done some initial testing, but we're not 100% sure that they're truly delivering the TLS packets consistently. So, I mean, by the end of the year, we should be able to have probably three more TLS routes uh, that will be more competitive than within the PRIs. And so the PRI routes traditionally haven't been of interest to the lower cost hobbyist levels just because of the price points. Um, you know, it's the the per minute rates go up 
but um but again like i said i'm i'm hoping that um that bandwidth and um and uh onyx should have their tls routes stabilized and in service by the you know fully in service by the end of the year okay so that that will open up that part of the industry have you done any um messaging stuff through asterix or do you uh, handle something else um we've pulled sms across we pulled standard sms through the asterisk platform and it works fairly well um it's a it's a limited because it, it really is doing text in, inside of the SIP message packets. Mm -hmm. So what we what we've traditionally done there is, you know, we we allowed some outbound from certain phone devices through it. Uh, we've done some bridging for WebRTC over to the SMS based platforms, and it's it's pretty straightforward to implement. You basically just need to be tied into carriers that will take the um, the messaging via via SMS or via SIP. Um, we actually are in the process of converting away from that with most of our carriers. So, um, we have 3 carriers that currently today take SMS or will deliver SMS via SIP. But, um, because of the limitation of what SMS really offers, you can't do MMS at all mm -hmm. through it. You can, uh, because MMS is a, um, is basically an IP based product. Um, and so it's not really designed around the traditional voice communications. Um, so one of the challenges in delivering, uh, the messaging is supporting the standards. You got basic text on SMS and then you got MMS, which is your text plus URL links, uh, embedded. And so. Most of the carriers now are kind of getting away from that being delivered in the SIP transmission. Um, the opportunity for us is to then be able to also take, because we're developing it on our network platform, we actually can take the MMS messaging and the SMS messaging, which is delivered direct via IP from our, from, um, our most of our carriers. And then we can actually peel the text off and put it into the SIP messaging ourselves. So we can still deliver to the phone units that the customers have on their desk. Mm -hmm. We can still deliver SMS and, and text-based messaging. We can also take that text-based messaging when it comes in, hits our platform, we can then broker it out onto the MMS system. So it gives you kind of that hybrid where um, it allows us to service both platforms. And then it also allows us to go one step further we can then take in messaging from other sources other than the actual desk phone and be able to convert it and and put it into the transmission loops. So that's, you know, asterisk does support the text based messaging very well um, because it is just a SIP based packet. It's a messaging packet with the uh, the type set to messaging and then the text is encoded into the packet into the into the data layer on the packet. Okay. So, uh, I haven't been fortunate enough to have a carrier that I was working with that used SIP messaging. They were using Jabber. So I had to create some sort of interface between Jabber and uh, Asterisk to uh, generate the SIP messaging for soft phones in my case. Okay. Okay. So they were delivering by by Jabber. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our carriers, you know, like I said, we have them that do, do deliver via via SIP messaging directly, and so we have we have a number of customers that are currently on that because that's what they wanted. They wanted it to come right in. They wanted to drop on their SIP phones. Um, the downside is is when customer when when people send MMS messaging to them, they it gets you know, the messagings get really garbled. I mean, because we can pick the text level parts of the messages. And um, and the SIP flows in on it, but the messages con consistently get truncated, and any URLs or any attachments are just dropped because they're they're actually sent as part of a, a message content um, uh, attachments stream, 
And so those those aren't aren't included as part of the the, the text based messaging. So that's that's kind of one of the things that we're seeing with that. Um, you know, the big thing that we're doing right now with most of the customers there is we'll deliver an SMS or, you know, if it's, if it's an MMS based message, we'll send a SIP based text message to them to notify them that they've got an MMS message that they can then go look for, look at from the, from the, from the website. Okay. So, but a, a lot of our messaging today is, you know, the, the, the new platform that we're going to for our internal systems we're actually taking the messages, all the messaging in by, via direct um, APIs. So from our upline carriers, we're tied directly into their their messaging servers, and we get trigger notices every time a message flows in, and we send like, out every like time that. it flows out. Like via webhook or something like that. Yeah, I mean they're basically it's it's basically flowing via you know soap based messaging. Okay. API soap based messaging. And so Twilio does that. Um, you know, there's a number of other vendors that do that, but it's very similar to what Twilio does. Twilio overcomplicates a lot of their stuff, but um, you know, I, I'm not quite, sh I don't quite understand why they do what they do, but you know, Twilio has an API system. Well, I said, we, we have our, we have uh, three carriers on the messaging side that they also have APIs so we can actually um, push most push messaging through them. We have one primary messaging company that we deal with uh, on a regular basis. And then we have the other two that we utilize because they have some specialty services that customers want um, in the messaging areas. And so we've tied into their platforms so that we can support those additional features. Okay, cool. Thank you for the overview. Yeah, it's been a while since I've looked into that. Yeah. So, um, you know, Asterisk itself, um, I think, it, I, as we talked yesterday uh, a little bit, is you know they're they're currently coming out with Asterisk version 17, um, and they've over, they keep overhauling the system, and so they there is talk at some point with this with the 18 chain about including some more MMS hooks um, to be able to support you know, maybe passing through MMS packages, but I don't know where they're going to go with that. So it, it, that expands a little bit beyond kind of where they're at. Asterisk today does in, in 16 and 17, they are pretty, pretty much deprecated this, the traditional SIP, the old SIP stack, and mm -hmm. they've completely moved their whole stack to PJ SIP for the, the SIP signaling uh, and protocol portion. So the PJ SIP project has pretty much taken on becoming the de facto industry standard for the signaling SIP layers. So Asterisk used to have their own platform and now, now they've kind of given that up and they wrap all of their advanced features around the PJ SIP stack. How's the, uh, the integration with other VoIP providers these days? Um... Maybe Facebook or um, Signal or um, uh, Skype or Zoom or something like that. I mean, if you if the if the vendor takes standard SIP protocol, the integration is clean. No, um, don't I wouldn't imagine. What? These people don't I wouldn't imagine. I mean, it depends. I mean, uh, Zoom actually has a SIP based product that they sell to companies. They have a direct voice over IP division that, and they actually tie, they have some SIP tie-ins. But um, beyond that, you know, the, the, the big tie-ins are the WebRTC bridges. Okay. So, so Astros has full WebRTC functionality. And so one of the biggest ways to tie into some of these different platforms is utilizing the WebRTC. We're actually doing some development right now with, um, with Speedix, which is basically the WebRTC platform that only Office uses. So that's an open source project. And we're doing some tie-ins between Asterisk, leveraging Asterisk as the WebRTC gateway for that particular platform. So we're hoping within the next probably six months to be able to 
fully provide um, audio tie, you know, audio call in into the um, the next cloud talk system so that our network can work directly with the next cloud talk system so that if you're utilizing next cloud and you run the next cloud talk module for video conferencing and and video sharing, you know, or messaging, uh, you could also make phone calls out from that and receive phone calls in directly to that platform. So we're going that route because we're very big with the net with the next with the next cloud platform. We have a number of customers that we host that product for. And we're looking for ways to tie in to continue continue the support for our customers with that particular platform. Cool. That sounds interesting. So okay. Well it looks like we're coming up on um 230 here. Um were we able to answer uh, you know the questions that were of most interest to you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, I think I sent you my contact information, Paul, um, through the messaging. I don't know if you got that last night. Uh, I didn't see it, but I did see your name pop up. I guess that's okay. why. Yeah, if you click on oh. if you click on the me your messaging area, you should see that I sent you my contact information. If you want to follow up or have a conversation after after bar camp, uh, if you definitely feel free to give me a call. Okay, cool. Always, right, always have fun networking with people in regards to the communications systems. Yeah, it's hard to find people that are interested in asterisks. Um, yeah, it used to be much bigger, but I'm yeah. not sure what's going on in the industry. 